These are strange, strange times to be a Boston Red Sox fan. A wonderful team, albeit that was doing some shenanigans behind the scenes, have been broken up. And the supposed big market Red Sox are acting like they are, I don't know, a small revenue team. It's a lot to process, but I have the right person to do it. Lauren Willand of Locked On Red Sox makes her first appearance on a show with that last name. This is Locked On MLB. You are Locked On MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all the Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. You don't believe me? Check me out there. I have a lower third. You can call me Sully. I'm an Emmy nominated television producer who has been doing baseball podcasts for the last 10 years and the last four seasons here on the Locked On Podcast Network. You can follow this show at Locked On MLB Pods on both Twitter and on Instagram. If you want to follow me, go to Instagram where I'm at Sully Baseball Podcast. And you can also subscribe to YouTube. Those of you watching us here on the YouTubes, we're here. Subscribe, hit the subscribe button, and you'll see the latest episodes here. And if you have a smart device, be sure to tell it to play podcast Locked On MLB. Or check out some of the other great shows on the Locked On Podcast Network, like let's just pick one totally at random. Locked On Red Sox! With my dear friend for many years, but not always with this name. It's Lauren Willen, the host of Locked On Red Sox. Congratulations. <laughs> I think this is the first time on since you've been married, if I'm not mistaken. It is. Yes, it is. Holy smokes. Wow, that is something. You know, you and I have been, uh, I first appeared on your old podcast. Yeah. Uh, that was 2014, I think it was, because we were talking yeah. about the aftermath. And this is, by the way, what we should do is just play that podcast. <laughs> I know. Because you were asking me about, the Red Sox just won a World Series and management is tearing the team apart. Why are they doing that? Da, 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 da. So let's just ro we'll roll tape and we'll call the show. Perfect. Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. Where are you? So you're in you're in my old neck of the woods. Yes. Uh, and I'm where the 2018 Red Sox play, which is just down the street from Dodger Stadium. Um, yeah, this is a uh... okay. Let's just let's just let's just get a couple of formalities out of the way. You're the host of Locked on Red Sox. Um, it's great. By the way, it's great. Listen, if you don't have to be a Red Sox fan. It's, you know, it's a great show. And I love listening to you, to your show. Um, yes. We read, so I, I grew up a Red Sox fan. I'm not, I make no bones about it. I was born in New England. I was, I remember 1979. Thank God. I don't remember 1978, but yes. Red Sox, we have to get this out of the way. This is like reading a legal disclaimer. Yes, we all would have done anything to see one World Series title in our lives. And now there have been four. The last one was a little shady, but, you know, okay, fine. The fact that we have four to choose from makes us say thank you to this ownership for delivering multiple World Series titles. And two of them uh, also included eliminated the New York Yankees in the postseason, which we would not have been able to imagine. We've seen wonderful, great memories, great home runs, great cops jumping up and down and everything like that. So don't anyone say, and do you concur? And two of them included uh, Xander Bogarts. That's true. Okay, well, they did it. I'm just trying to, I have to get the positive thing right out <laughs> front. Because I said, you Red Sox fans would have done this and that. You don't even know. No, we're getting that out front. We're not discounting that, okay? Because I have a feeling we're going to say some bad things about management. And I believe you should always start with something nice. You should. Before. I agree. So, so we, I'm not, I am acknowledging that. Do you acknowledge what I just said, Lauren? I do acknowledge. Okay, good. 
And we also acknowledge that our lives would be a lot worse if the original person who wanted to buy the Red Sox, Frank McCourt, bought the team. And can you imagine that if he drove the team into the ground and we, they'd still be chanting 1918? Oh, my God. Yeah, that, <laughs> that parallel universe exists. It does, okay. and it's weird. It's weird. It's okay. We got that out of the way. We did. Mark the time. 515 on this podcast. We got that out of the way. Now, let's deal with today. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> In 2018, the Boston Red Sox won a World Series. Yes, Astros fans, there were shenanigans going on with some soon-to-be-beloved homegrown players. Mookie Betts, Jackie Bradley Jr., Andrew Benintendi, Xander Bogarts, Raphael Devers, even the likes of a Christian Vasquez, were all part of a squad that we said, wow, they won the World Series with the best record, and they have a homegrown core. All those players were in their mid to early 20s. There's a lot more where this came from, and here we sit at the end of the 2022 season, and the only player left from that group is Raphael Devers, and he has as good a chance for playing for the 2024 Red Sox as I do. Yeah. What the hell happened? That's That's been the question. That's The theme of Lockdown Red Sox this offseason is, what are the Red Sox doing? Because there was that homegrown talent. And yes, it's it, it hurt losing Christian Vasquez the way the Red Sox, how they conducted that trade. Yes, right. Andrew Benintendi, he, tried, he was trying to do too much. And it just wasn't working in Boston for him anymore. And Xander Bogarts, there's absolutely no reason why he's not with the Red Sox anymore. And there's absolutely no reason that Raphael Devers shouldn't be with the Red Sox after 2023. But with how everything has gone since Mookie Betts, fans have no reason or no optimism to to think Raphael Devers will be here in 2024. And they have every right to feel that way. Because how, how everything has gone down and you have new reports coming out about the whole Mookie situation over the last week. It's just like, what is going on? What are the Red Sox doing? What is High and Bloom doing? Like, what is the ownership doing? What is going on? I mean, remember, we are 12, we're about 14 months removed from the Red Sox being two wins away from the World Series. Crazy. And now we're so looking at So much can change in a year. And look at, um, when I was on your old podcast back in 2014 and we were talking about the dismantling of the 2013 Red Sox, I made the point that we had to remember that the 2013 Red Sox World Championship was a rebuilding year. That may sound strange, but it was a rebuilding year. They happened to win the World Series in a rebuilding year, but they did. They had the whole idea of that year was they're building up, you know, they, there was the disaster of 2011 and the Bobby V year. I said, hey, let's build a new team up from the ground up and put a bunch of veteran placeholders for the young players before they come up. As it turned out, the veteran placeholders rallied and they beat a very, very good Tigers and a very, very good St. Louis Cardinal team to win the World Series. We all loved it. Boston Strong, it's our effing city. Obviously, we all tear up when we see it. But I made the point that was a rebuilding year. Mike Napoli wasn't a long-term solution. Shane Victorino was not a long-term solution. The long-term solutions were rising up through the farm, and that bought him a few years to develop them. And then, as if we were playing Farmville, they started to blossom and bloom, ironically, as uh, the name bloom is going to have a different term. And this felt like a different squad. The 2004 team, we all loved them. They were mercenaries. Almost that entire team were mercenaries. There were more homegrown players on the 2007 team, but we also started seeing that was going to be a little, there was a little more prickly and not as cute and cuddly. This team in 2018 felt like a core. Yes. Kind of like, <clears throat> dare I say it, Jeter, Bernie Williams, Pos you know, Posada, Rivera, Pettit, that kind of core. And you started to see, oh, wait a second. This is going to be the team for a while. We can really get to know these guys. Wrong. Yeah. Wrong. Big wrong. Big old fat wrong. And they and th they led us to believe that they would be here long term. And maybe that's on Red Sox fans for being naive. 
Some of us were naive and believed that they would do everything they can to get Mookie Betts back, even or get Mookie Betts not to to keep to be in Boston long term. But at the end of the day, it seemed like we all knew he was going to be traded, no matter who was sitting in High and Bloom's seat. But it's just it kind of reminds me of the Bogart situation. It should have never got to that point. Like, why did you have to disrespect him with a low ball offer? If he wants to play here, you know you've had success with these guys. What what are you doing just getting getting rid of them? What are you doing letting Xander Bogarts walk out for free if this was your plan the entire time? These, I mean, it's, it goes beyond too just being good players. They're also likable players. They're yeah. they were having fun. You had the wind dance repeat in 2018. Like these guys were just having a lot of fun. There was so much character and charisma on this team that it just seemed like they were unbreakable. And then yeah. we fast forward to 2022 and we're like. What is going on? Everything is just crumbling like slowly in front of our eyes. And there's just absolutely nothing that Red Sox fans can do except just be angry and yell in on, on Twitter and just continue to feel like helpless, especially when it comes to Raphael Devers. Yeah, and you take a look at Devers. I'm sorry. It is the biggest surefire bet that Devers is going to be playing for another team in 2024 and if you're going to make any bets go to bet online it remains your number one source for sports betting info stats news and analysis get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football to college football bowl season which is going on right now the nba and not too long from now we're gonna have march madness got it all betonline.net and if you love sports podcasts you could even find those at bet online as well Always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online. That's where the game starts. Okay. Let's uh you 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 put up a couple of very interesting points that I wanted to get to, but there was such an easy way to sneak in the library and I decided to do it. Um in in the previous years, they got rid of some stars before they knew they were gonna break down. So there was a sense of all right, that was like, look, at we we all love Damon and Pedro and Derek Lowe and all those players, but they they we knew signing them to a long term deal would not be smart, and we saw that was the case. You know, the same thing with the likes of you know Euclid, who we loved, and all these other players in Papelbon, but you know what? They let them break down on someone else's dime. So you know, Jacoby Ellsbury helped the Red Sox win two World Series, and he cashed in with the Yankees, where he was in a full body cast for the most time he was there. <laughs> That doesn't seem like what's happening here. And the thing that's so aggravating is that we had just had a, um, you know, how did they beat the Yankees eventually? They beat them by out yanking the Yankees. We all saw that. We all saw they started out spending. They started, they got into, we got to go tete-a-tete, bring in Schilling, bring in folk, bring in all, you know, doing all that stuff. Boom, that, that happened. And, you know, and we all loved it. But, there was a sense of the Red Sox were being mentioned in the same breath as the Yankees as big time spenders and everything like that. And then to turn around and seeing them making moves that are torpedoing the team for the sake of saving money. When we all know the Red Sox are printing money and have one of the richest teams in baseball to see them cutting, cutting coupons. I mean, I made the joke when Bogart signed with San Diego which was how can a small market team like Boston compete with the big spenders like San Diego? But that's kind of what happened. And the idea of you don't have to, you didn't have to have someone replace Betts or Bogarts or, or them. You had to just sign them. It's and that simple. Yeah. How much would you like? We have the money to do it. And, and now we're going to, you know, and, and you're right. They were likable. They were fun. They played great. The fans loved them. And, you know, and, and I'm, I'm going to put some blame on Bloom pretty soon. But to see them turn into a cost-cutting organization just seems at, you know, greedy at best and reckless at worst. Yeah, it's, it's mind-boggling because – Not that long ago, we were watching Dave Dombrowski do whatever he had to do to make deals, to get guys to sign in Boston. And it didn't matter the price tag, it seemed like. I mean, Deal and Dave, we knew exactly who Dave Dombrowski was when he came into the Red Sox organization. 
and Bloom is the polar opposite. And it makes me wonder if front office 100% knew exactly the guy they were getting in Bloom and were like, yeah, he's not going to want to spend a lot of money. He'll listen to us if we tell him, you know, don't spend too, too much. Here's your limits. Here's this, here's that. But when you're letting guys go, calibers of Xander Bogarts, potentially Raphael Devers, Mookie Betts, when they've all said they want, they've wanted to stay in Boston, Betts would have accepted the same offer that he got from the Dodgers if the Red Sox had offered him that. Bogarts went to the Red Sox when he had the deal from the Padres and offered them one more opportunity to make it right. And they said no. So it's just absolutely a complete 180 in the worst way possible over the last few years because you've had that you had that core. And when your team has a core, it makes them so much more fun. I, I think of the Bruins. They've had the same core of what seems like 20 years with Patrice Bergeron, David Krejci minus one year. And you, Brad Marchand is getting up there now. And you just had their fun. People want to tune in for that. Who's going to want to tune into a Red Sox team that only has Raphael Devers to really like showboat this team. Yes, they have Justin Turner, but he's not going to turn on TVs, is he? It's it's just Tristan Casas, yes, for the excitement factor, but you don't know if he's going to pan out. There's just so much uncertainty with this team, and now you have no idea who's going to play shortstop, and if Trevor Story does play short, then you have, do you move Kike Hernandez to second? Like what what are we doing here? You yeah. you had the talent. You have also had the money. It's not about not having the money. You had the talent. You had the money, and now you have the money and no talent. Yeah. I mean, well, first, I mean, I'm, I'm I believe the lion's share of the blame of this goes to the front office, which is why I did my disclaimer at the top. You know, I, I did a podcast a few um, maybe last month or a few weeks ago where I said let's remove the stigma of buying a championship. There's no stigma to that. That's your job as ownership is to spend the money you have to buy a championship and dealing Dave Dombrowski. Yeah. He takes a look and say, who are my best prospects? Who can I get for them? You know, I'm going to spend lots of money, but guess what happens? I mean, I've, I've said this before. He has left a series of pennants in his wake in Miami, in Detroit, in Boston, now Philadelphia, his method works. Here's my method. I am going to forget the future because, sure, you can trade a prospect in a way and they wind up becoming Ryan Sandberg or Jeff Bagwell or John Smoltz. But most of the time, they're Matt Laporta. You know, even the deal for Chris Sale, Yohan Makata is an okay player, but he was never he's never become an all-star. And the Red Sox got a, a guy who was a Cy Young contender for a couple of years. Now, one thing that's frustrating for, for you and for me is that Dombrowski signed sale and some of those other ones to big long-term deals when those big long-term deals probably should have been dangled in front of Betts and Bogarts. But maybe instead of people looking at the raise method of let's cut as many coupons and be as cheap as humanly possible, maybe take a look at the Braves method, which is we have a team, let's get our players, let's sign as many of our players as we can to long-term contracts early. Did it work for everyone? No, they wound up losing Freddie Freeman. They wound up losing Dansby Swanson. But they wound up having a core of really good homegrown players who are going to be there for a while. If you're a Braves fan, you can attach some emotion there. I'm old enough to remember Rice, Lynn, Evans, Yastrzemski, Fisk, Hobson, who was my guy, Remy Burleson, George Scott, Louis Tiant, you know, the ones who you look at, oh, that's those guys are the Red Sox. And they're together for at least – at least give them a chance for another pennant, you know? And to see it broken apart as as fast as it was broken apart is just surreal. Yeah, to say to say the least, because you said it when you have that attachment to players, you, you think you're they're going to be here for a long time. Yeah, I thought Bogarts would be here for life. I thought toward the end, when it started getting toward that free agency thing with Mookie, I'm like, oh, he's gone. He's, he doesn't he doesn't sound like he wants to be here and even even if he does I think it's too late and I think that's the whole thing same thing with Bogart. You never it's get to too it late. being too late. Exactly, and it shouldn't be this way with Devers. You, you should see how everything that's happened with Mookie with Xander, even how the Christian Vasquez trade unfolded, how just angry fans were. Like the fans give you the revenue. The fans are buying tickets that you're raising every single year. They want good product on the field. They want their favorite players 
out there. If you want to grow the game, you need to keep these kinds of players on your team. It, I mean, it, it'd be great if we could have Xander Bogarts, Mookie Betts, Raphael Devers toting them out there every single night. It'd be it'd be great. I'd be it'd be so much better than the position the Red Sox are in now. But they're out there with just a, a mess of people, and they're they're talented players, but they're not elite. What are you going to do? Put Christian Arroyo at second base? to keep Kike Hernandez in, out, in the outfield where he has succeeded, even though you signed him to be a second baseman. It's just, there's too many questions and there shouldn't be this many questions when you had all of it right in front of you. You just didn't pay them. And it'd be it'd probably be a different story if anyone else was in where Haim Bloom is sitting right now. Yeah. Think about in that final clinching game in 2018, that's, and J.D. Martinez homered, and David Price pitched seven great innings. And he did. By, and was relieved by Joe Kelly. And um, they're, uh, I mean, they're all, at least between last year and this and this upcoming season, they'll all be wearing Dodger uniforms. And meanwhile, Turner and Kenley Jansen and Alex Verdugo and Kiki Hernandez are all wearing Red Sox uniforms. So it's like they swapped teams, um, but they're getting, we're getting the broken down ones. Oh, and by the way, look out for Kenley Jansen. I live in Los Angeles. I've seen a lot of Dodger games. Yes, he's piled up saves with low ERAs. There have been so many games in the regular season, but especially the postseason, which end with Kenley Jansen walking off the field with his head down. OK, he is going to be I, I'm not I'm, I saw he was signed by the Red Sox. I said, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Now, look at. We've been we've been heaping a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, for the lack of the word blame on John Henry, the that being me and Lauren Willand. I almost said Wyland. <laughs> Wyland of locked on Red Sox. Wyland. I, <laughs> Wyland. Do I, do I get it wrong? Wait, no, it's, it's no, it's it's Wyland. I wish it was okay. Wyland. That'd be cool. I'm gonna change That's it to Wyland. Yeah, there you go. Why, Lauren Wyland. <laughs> you should be on a motorcycle there. Um, I, I'm I'm not gonna heap all the blame on Bloom because he, you know, he's obviously taking orders from management. But here's the other thing. He's gotta do I mean we he's just have a backbone. Want, you, we gotta see the if you're gonna trade players away, you can get stuff back for them. The yes. Mookie Betts trade has turned into an abject disaster. Verdugo, they could have got a player of Verdugo's quality without sacrificing a homegrown MVP. And we saw one of the other pieces in that, Jeter Downs, just got DFA'd. And we also saw the fact like, okay, if you're not going to sign J.D. Martinez and you're not going to sign Nathan Neovaldi and you're not going to sign Xander Bogarts to long-term deals, then why the hell don't you try to get something for him at the trade deadline? That's another thing too. Like I questioned if Hyam Bloom has ever read the scouting reports on some of the people that he's acquired. And yes, prospects, you never know with prospects. They are hit or miss. They could be the top rated prospect and still be a miss in their career. Or they can be some lower rated prospect and be the, the biggest steal of the century. You never know. But there has to be some sort of just reading those prospects, the, the scouting reports, talking with other people and not just being like, oh, he has good analytics. Oh, he has good potential. He has good this. You just, the Red Sox are not a team or the Red Sox, yeah, they're not a team that can just sit around and wait to be rebuilt for, and, and if you're not going to come out and say that, come yeah. out and say if you're going to rebuild because the fans would appreciate it all day want i feel like the fans right now just want a little bit of transparency a little bit of truth because they haven't gotten that since the season ended they honestly they, they haven't gotten that since they've been talking about oh yeah xander bogarts is our number one priority but there needs to be like some deeper research into Wait, do you the, mean the, bogarts or or oh, no, bogarts or devers i mean is, oh no, no you're right when they, no, that's right that's right before before you started saying yeah right. yeah and but yeah if you're if you are going to trade devers you need to get a haul for him. Yes, he's in a contract year. Like you you know what he's done. He's gotten better every single year. And he's he's going to, he's an elite hitter. Even if you just want to use him as a DH, you know what he can do at the offensive with his offensive power. Get a haul for him. Don't just let him walk for nothing and don't just get these prospects that may or may not turn into something that you end up DFAing one of the other key pieces down the line. It's just a bad bad look. 
it, it just needs to be better. My, my motto for 2023 is be better. Um, there have been times where the Red Sox have done a rebuild, and I feel that there has been – I think the Sox fans have, you know, have been okay with it because there's a sense of transparency. You're right. The year after the Bobby V year was obviously 2013, but everyone went into it going like, all right, this is uh, – we, we need to we need to cleanse our palate here. But the years afterwards, yes, it was a little bit bewildering that they were they got so bad so fast. But there was the promise of, oh, but there's some players coming up through the farm. There's some young, there's some young pieces that are coming up. So 14 and 15, while not great individual years for Boston, there was a sense of, all right, but they're doing something. Right. They're up to something. And I, I, I almost would rather see them not bring in the Kenley Jansons and the Justin Turners of the world and say, hey, we're just going to play a bunch of young kids. And we're not better than the Yankees or Toronto. So we're going to build a bunch of young kids and we're going to build a new team up. You know, and now, of course, they're trying to sell tickets. But like, who's who's running to the ticket master? Boy, I just aged myself there. Who's running to to get uh, RedSox.com to get season tickets? Because, oh, man, we just got Justin Turner. You know, right. I mean, nobody, it just, it feels, it feels like they're, they're acting like they're the pirates. And it's weird. Like when, when they were in those rebuilding years and there was that hope because they had those players coming up, you don't really have that. You have Brian Bayo, you have Brian Mata, but Brian Bayo, you, you just, he came up before he was MLB ready to no fault of his own. A lot of these guys did last year to no fault of their own, but you have Jaron Duran, who is a top-rated prospect, or, and he's just a failure on so many levels. And he's just – now he's in Worcester. You don't know where, what his role is with this team. There's just not a lot of hope for the like, – the future looks bright in terms of people like Marcelo Meyer, maybe even Blaze Jordan you could throw in there. There are glimmers of hope three or four years down the road, but it shouldn't have to take that long because you're the Boston Red Sox. Like This is not what they do. And if this was the plan from the very beginning, this goes back to just being transparent. Be like, we, we're going to rebuild. This is going to be a while. This is going to be painful. Honesty goes a long way with a fan base like the Red Sox who have a lot of uh, winning in their lifetime. I mean, my co-host Jake, he's 10 years younger than me. All he knows is Red Sox winning in World Series. Lucky him. Like, this is, this is hard for him to be like, what are they doing? I don't understand. Yeah. Well, look at I mean, they just need, they need a plan, but they also, can you imagine you have this, all those young players coming, all this young talent coming up and they would come up and be put under the wing of a Betts, a Bogarts, mm -hmm. a, a Raphael Devers. Even J.D. You know. Martinez. Yeah. Well, J.D. Martinez is like having another hitting coach. Yeah. He was you awesome know, I mean, while he was here. I mean, I, you look at this team and it just, it, it feels like. Who is the leader? Yeah, who are, who's, what's the identity of this team? <laughs> right. Yes, I what's mean, the identity? What's the direction? Like, wh what is this team? In 2013, I keep going back to that. It was a rebuilding year, and they won it. But they still had Ortiz. They still had Pedroia. They still had John Lester. They still had some pieces from the team that had won before. You know, Clay Buckles was in a huge part of 2007, but he threw a no-hitter that year. He did. And, you know, Jacoby Ellsbury was not the starting center field for most of the year, but he was by the end of the year. So they had about, what, four or five, you know, strong ties to the 07 team. And, you know, they had a couple of players who were, you know, um, you know, a couple of the players like, you know, tangential players who were, who were part of the 07 squad as well. Um, but the, mainly those. And you were able to see, okay, you know, put a bunch of veterans around them. They still have a little bit of an identity. I have no clue what the identity of this team is. I have no that clue is... who the – and I don't know and, – and we're not even breaking down the pitching staff. I mean, forget <laughs> identity. I, I mean, identity, like, who the hell is going to pitch? Yeah. I mean, the rotation, you, you hope Sale is going to be some sort of return to form. But hope. you have James Paxton, who you don't even know if he's going to be healthy enough. Hopefully he is. 
But again, you don't know what he's going to, what you're going to get from him. He hasn't pitched in what, two years? You have Garrett Whitlock, who should be in the bullpen, but I, I rant about enough about that. You have Tanner Houck, who should also be in the bullpen as a longer reliever because he can never really, could never really figure it out as a starter. You just, and Brian Bayo, but you, you, again, you don't know what you're going to get from Bayo. Nick Pavetta, you either get like eight shutout innings or four and then and a third and gives up eight runs. So it's just, who's your ace? Who is pitching opening day? Because if I'm, if you sit those guys in front of me right now, I don't know who I'm saying. Maybe I'm going to lean toward Nick Pavetta just because he's got reliability and stability and won't miss a start when it comes to this team. Or do I go with Chris Sale, who has the opening day experience, but also has really struggled to stay healthy during his time, his extension time with the Red Sox. It's it's almost kind of scary because usually it's always a lock. It's like, it's either going to be a Valdi or Sale. And now it's like, take your pick. Let's put all the names in a hat and just hope for the best. And it's, and it's a shame. It's it a is. shame because they had, they had a chance to have a a generational core and to build around. And now they're and, all now they're on the West Coast, most of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna as a Red Sox fan, I'm gonna love to see the Red Sox play here at Dodger Stadium. Mm-hmm. Um, That'll be awesome. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, I don't get it. I don't get it. You know, Stacy Gutsilius of Locked On Yankees kept ranting for the last year or so saying, you know, the Yankees act like it uh, when it comes down to their spending. Um, you want to say to John Henry, he said, thank you for the four championships, but you're the Red Sox. Act, act like it. <laughs> All you had to do was you had the players there. But the Red Sox have always had a strange, like not, uh, a, not, not a strong appreciation of their own players. I mean, Last week was the Look anniversary. at David Ortiz. Well, yeah, or but like the but Ortiz at least finished with the Red Sox. Yes, you know, I mean, like I'm. I remember we're in uh, uh, last week was the anniversary of them forgetting to put their contracts in the mail for Fred Lynn and oh. Carlton Fisk, so the, it was postmarked too late, and they were declared free agents, and they they hastily traded Fred Lynn to to California. And meanwhile, Fisk winds up signing with the White Sox and played more years with the White Sox than he did with the Red Sox. And all the while, whether it's, you know, whether it's Mo Vaughn or John Lester, you know, you would go down the line of, you know, Dwight Evans, players who just were great Red Sox, who just, uh, we'll let them scram. Um, you know, they had a chance to just have something that, that they hadn't had for a long, long time. And to do it to save money to me is just that's banana boat time to to do it to save money with no plan in place and for for the Red Sox to come out and say that they that they're still going to feel the competitive team in 2023 okay good luck there's still off season left but there's just not a lot of hope left in Red Sox fans and 100% justified and that means we have to bust out our 04 07 13 and 18 DVDs Thank God we have a choice of four. And thank God we have a choice of a great host of Locked On Red Sox, Lauren Willand. Tell people where they can find you. You can find me on Twitter at la 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 Lauren, three laws, Lauren of four hours. Really on any social media platform, that's my handle. Just Google that and anything that is mine will pop up. And then all of my written work with the Red Sox, a lot of brewing stuff is right on Nesson.com as well. And then I host another podcast with some friends called Snipe and Sully. Just we chat hockey for an hour and a half once a it's week. It's not me. It's not it, me. No, it's not Sully. It's not Sully. We do not talk hockey. We talk baseball with Sully, not hockey. That's right. Well, and you can follow us on Twitter at Locked On MLB Pod. Same handle for Instagram. And you can subscribe to us on YouTube or you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at Sully Baseball Podcast. Thanks so much for making Locked On MLB your first listen every day. For your second listen, obviously make that Locked On Red Sox. Make sure to check out Locked On Sports today, though. It's the biggest stories from around the sports world in 20 minutes or less, plus instant reactions, game recaps, and Locked On's take of the day. Locked On Sports today is available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Talking about a rudderless franchise known, formerly known as the Boston Red Sox, now called the Boston Dodgers, with the newly minted Lauren Willand. I am Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.